Did you know that people with autism present higher IQ scores than average? And studies found that neurodiverse teams are 30% more productive than neurotypical ones and made fewer errors. Despite this, neurodiverse people are more likely to be unemployed than people with any other disability. So we are here today to change that by supporting Mark's mission to neurodivergent people achieving their full potential at work. Neurotide was founded in November 2023 by Mark, but Mark has been supporting organisations and individuals with neuroinclusion and neurodiversity since 2015. And I remember when workplace mental health just became a thing back then. And Mark and I met at a face-to-face um, -face event it sounds strange saying that now, thinking about 2015. Um, so I've known about Mark in this space for a very long time. Mark has authored two resources, the Neurodiversity Guidebook, which will be available soon, and we will get that out to you as a resource from today, and the 11 Principles of Neurodiversity Inclusion, which we'll be sharing with you to take away again at the end of the session. I think what makes Mark so authentic in his contributions is because of his first-hand experience. He has ADHD, he has Asperger's, PTSD and epilepsy. So Mark's insights are not only informative, but also has a really personal touch to it. So hopefully get your challenge in the chat box. You know, let us use Mark as a resource today. Let us know what your challenges are, but let us all be a resource for each other as well. Post any positive outcomes that you have had experienced from embracing neurodiversity. You know, let's share that really great stuff that you're all doing. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Hello, welcome. <laughs> Great stuff. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. And it's great to, like I say, um, catch up with you again. I mean, 2015, how long ago? That's scary, isn't it? It's, it's when we think about it. Do you remember that then. first day that we met? I'd heard, didn't I, back then? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a long time ago. So I've got some questions for you, Mark. Let's have a, have a great conversation about this. Let's go in. Tell me why you're on this mission for neurodivergent people achieving their full potential at work. What is the story behind that? You know, what gets you out of bed on a morning and lights your fire with this? Um, when I, I wasn't diagnosed until my late 30s or early 30s um, with ADHD and, and uh, autism. And it was my late teens where I was diagnosed with uh, epilepsy. Um. And I always wanted to, well, fly to Nooks for the military and then join the police service. Two pensions. Um, <laughs> there was an incentive there, but so I always wanted to do. But for some reason, they don't like people flying or driving blue lights who are epileptic. So that threw that career off, off to, to a tangent. And I became lost because um, I always wanted to do that. Uh, I knew what I wanted to do. There was no change. Um... I mean, there was family in the military and the police service, so I had a, an inside track, if you like. So, um, but I was lost. And to cut a long story short, I uh, fell into insurance and and, and uh, uh, had a few jobs here and there. And it got to about 2014, 15, and, and I was looking for work and I couldn't find anything or my CV wasn't up to date. I didn't have a degree. And thankfully, that's been dropped now. A lot of places dropped the need for a degree. And and so I started, uh, never wanted to go into recruitment, um, but I started a recruitment agency to help people with neurodivergent conditions. I uh, placed about 10 people. So about a year, year and a half, uh, closed the business uh, and just carried on doing the neurodiverse stuff. Um, and when I was doing my business plan for the recruitment agency, uh, like you say, there's there's uh, a small amount of people that are employed who are neurodiverse. Um, the uh, disability stats, the average is about 55% across the board. All disabilities are em in employment. Um, if you have uh, a heart condition or diabetes, I think it's the, the late 60s, 
Um, if you have, um, I think a limb uh, missing or something like that, um, it's like in the 50s, uh, uh, late 50s, early 60s. And then right at the bottom, the bottom two groups, or actually, no, it's been split into two, into so bottom three groups. That's where I fall in. Um, if you're epileptic, you're in the, the bottom group, one uh, second group, then the third group. Third group is where epilepsy is. Uh, Thirty-three percent of people with epilepsy are employed, and then the, right at the bottom, um, less than twenty percent of people with uh, what you would argue is, is a, a mental health condition, uh, such as ADHD, autism, and so on, are employed. Um, even though we're more than capable, um, a lot of us start our own businesses because we, we've got the skills, we're entrepreneurial, and and so on. Um, but yeah, we, we we struggle to find employment, stay in employed. But things are changing, which is good. Um, check. Yeah, so that, that, that's what drives me, that employment rate disparity. Yes, that and that must have been absolutely heartbreaking for you to think, I what this is the career path. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people in this room would be like, oh, I fell into HR or <laughs> I fell into something. You know, a lot of us find that we don't really know what we want to, want to do as a career, but to have that dead set, this is what I want to do, this is what I'm passionate about, and yeah. your disability preventing that, that must have been a real setback. It, it How, was, yeah. Um, I mean, I know that I do work with the police as well, and, and um, alongside some other organisations, and I know they are quite open now to, you know, Bobby's on the beat who have, you know, autism or ADHD and, and so on, and they're embracing that uh, more, more so than ever. But it was obviously the epilepsy that got in the way there but um i think now i might be able to not do the job i want to do but um uh, i can still work for the police service if i wanted to yeah. uh, now but back then i couldn't and yeah. it's probably too late now <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm well 46 next week but um so i'm, I'm yeah i'm late. quite happy doing this actually i'm i'm, I'm quite motivated doing this <laughs> You know, that that's an amazing story. And I think what you've just evidenced there is that shift from um, you know, people who ha who are not, you know, who are neurodivergent, um, being very excluded from many workplaces. And mm. what you've just showed us there is that things are changing and we are being more inclusive um in workplaces, but we still have a long way to go, Mark. So yeah. This is why we're here today, is to really help all of these amazing people here today who are, thank you for showing up today, because that tells me that you are passionate and ready to make a change in your workplace so that your workplace is inclusive and embracing neurodiversity. Because as you can hear from Mark's story there, there are many, many other people out there who are could be a valuable asset to your workplace if we create the right environment and culture for them to join. So I've got a couple of questions for you, Mark. Uh, we hear this all of the time. HR are often shoehorned with additional responsibilities into their roles. You know, now in HR, you have to be also a well-being strategy professional. Um, you need to know about uh, mental health behaviour change inside out. And also, you know, ed &I is now a big responsibility for a lot of HR. Um, we often hear, we get this a lot, you know, we want to do something to improve the culture around mental health, but I just don't know where to start. So where should HR leaders start and for the people in the room today if they want to improve neuroinclusion? It um I would start with well, there's the eleven principles which I'm gonna share with you. <laughs> um that, that's a really good start in whatever order you need to, to start them. Um Using the social model of disability, I think if, if people are open and flexible uh, and, and encourage conversations um, and having employee networks, but not just having a network, uh, make sure that network has responsibilities for improving and enhancing in inclusion for uh, 
uh, people with ADHD or autism and, and so on and give them a budget and time to, to, to do that. Um, make sure within your organization you understand the conditions and how they present and how they can be different. Uh, and I like the, 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 it used to be thought of the spectrum as like the, the color profile, but it's now obviously a spiky profile. Um, and three people sat next to each other with ADHD each have a different spiky profile. <laughs> Um, and start to promote people um, within the organization to make sure that, you know, at all levels, obviously you've got to be skilled and qualified for the job. Um, but, um, and make sure all areas of your website are neuro-inclusive, whether that be, uh, sorry, the website, uh, whether that be policies, um, the workplace, um, not just from a sensory perspective, but when Emily, you were just uh, uh, talking before, I was just directly no, no, down in indirect discrimination. So that's where the biggie lies. Direct discrimination is quite obvious to see in many cases. Indirect, because it's a hidden disability, although not everyone feels are disabled, but for the Equality Act, technically you, you, you qualify. Um, um, Indirect discrimination, um, there's a lot of hidden barriers and tripwires, and it's just finding out where those are to make sure people can be, can thrive in the role they're in and then also get promoted or take a sideways step. And so, uh, 101 things, um, uh, well, let's get started, talk... yeah, but then obviously, you, yep. <laughs> Well, let us ask you a few questions about some things that you said there, because what that sounds like to me is you need to start with an understanding of what does a strategy look like when it comes to um, being neuro inclusive. And once you've got an understanding of what that strategy needs to look like and where some of the problems are, then you've mentioned budget in there. We can go to senior leadership team or you know whoever holds the purse strings to say this is what we need to do mm -hmm. and ha we need a budget to do that so one of my other questions around that was um we know budget <laughs> uh budget negotiations are an absolute battlefield you know a lot of hr and well-being leads are well do we invest in mental health menopause men's health edni financial well-being but what is the business case for embracing neurodiversity in the workplace? So if we know we need to do all of this stuff, that's great. We can do that. We need us to think about how we do that strategically. But then how do we get that budget that you mentioned to actually act out all of that planning that we need to do? So if I was sat in front of senior leadership today or writing a proposal for them, um, I, I would just highlight well all, all the benefits of neuro inclusion. Um, we, we're quite often neurodiverse people. We, we've got a, a great sense of humour, so we we lift morale around us, <laughs> um, and you know we don't often mo. We're quite honest in in the workplace, um, and and if we see something, we'll point it out. Um, Especially if you're autistic, you you, um, you might point something out. So it's it's good to have that highlight. So at least then you can make improvements or changes. Or um, you come back to me and say that's actually not wrong, Mark. But thanks for highlighting it. Let's move on. <laughs> um, you will have when you start making these changes from your from from a neuro inclusion perspective. It actually affects a lot of other areas, uh, like just touching on sensory. You know, with lighting and mood. You know, it, it helps everybody. Um, you'll have a lower staff turnover because neurodiverse people, partly from, from the um, lower employment rate, but also generally, we're, we're very loyal. Um, and so you, you'll find that we once we're there and, and you know, we're, we're molding together and we're working together, um, we, 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 um, we don't leave uh, unless we really have to. <laughs> Um, we're really focused on tasks and that, that increases productivity. We're really innovative. So if there's a new or better way of doing something, somebody might have invented the wheel, but we'll invent the other three, you know? <laughs> um, 
And once you've got uh, different people of cognitive, different skills and abilities in an organization, you can organize and distribute that workload accordingly and play to people's strengths. And with that, that, that leads on to then being able to, um, to, to an opportunity to, to develop um, new services or products for, for your customers. Mm. Um, you know, whether they, the neurodiverse or, or not. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a new demographic in there. And also, um, there was a, a report a couple of years ago, was it Clover Pop? They did a report that said um, diversity of, um, of thinking within a team, and, and it was focused on male, female, and ethnicity. It didn't include neurodiverse people, but being, being in the neurodiverse field, it, it just goes without saying, um, because we do think outside the box, and, and we, we're always looking at new ideas. Um, uh, the more diverse a team in that regard was increased the chances of faster decisions, but those decisions were better quality and you needed less meetings. I mean, hands up who wants to go to more meetings and less. Yeah, I've not seen any hands there. So <laughs> unless it's biscuits and, and coffee, I don't know. But um, I might put my hand up. But um, yeah, so you, it, it increases that productivity. Um, and, and and it challenges your own thoughts and you think, mm. oh, okay, well, I'll try that. That's really interesting, Mark. And I know just by looking in the room today that there are some people in the room whose workforce mm. are probably highly neurodiverse because of the industry that they're in. Uh, you know, engineering, I know, is often highly, um, have a high neurodiverse workforce as well. And I think what you were saying there is that the benefits of having the business, really the business cases uh, for employing and embracing neurodiversity is it, 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 it's beneficial for everyone in the organization to start off with. You've got a load of different skills, high levels of IQ, um, you know, great ways of being loyal to an organization because, you know, you're there, you, you, you're doing that work and unless you have to, so you've got, re, you know, retention of your staff, absolutely pivotal and potentially innovation, quicker, higher levels of innovation because you are thinking outside of the box more often than neurotypical people. Um, do you know what that could be in terms of uh, financial, like in pounds worth? Has anyone done any research like Deloitte about what is the return on investment on that? Um, there are some reports, um, but I'd have to do the research to find the research. <laughs> No, it was I just know a question. They're, they're out there. There's different articles, but um, De Deloitte do do uh, quite a few. <laughs> uh, they talk about that quite a lot, and, and uh, Harvard put out lots of articles. But yeah, the, there is that, that return on investment, and it, it doesn't really cost you to have a neurodiverse uh, person on on the payroll uh, more than it does anybody else, and in fact. Most reasonable adjustments are free or low cost. And there's, uh, as of the when I last looked, this year, financial year, um, just about to end, uh, there's £65,000 worth of grant funding mm -hmm. to pay for if somebody needs um, to, to a bit of support with, with, in their work. They can have, uh, you, you know, you, that, that will pay for somebody or um, to, to to help them yeah. in different ways or it might be for a bit of software or it mm -hmm. might be another bit of kit or something and that's every year so you if you need five thousand pounds a year then you get that every year mm -hmm. yeah. i mean the, the larger the firm that is a, 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 a like an excess i think is it thousand or fifteen hundred pounds but and it pay pays for or i mentioned training um generic training for everybody is or without anybody named isn't covered in it but i know um if it's about a very specific if it's about a named colleague mm -hmm. it's it's covered so if you're training their team about that individual and their condition or conditions yeah. then it, it's it's covered not just for neurodiversity for for other yeah you know uh conditions yeah. as well. um, okay. 
but yeah, there, there, there is definitely because we're entrepreneurial. Uh, we're always thinking. We think like the boss. We don't think like everyone around us. We think like the boss. How can we make this better? Mm -hmm. You know, we're always problem solving, and it's partly because when, when you're born with with our sort of conditions, um, yeah, they don't always the neurodevelopmental, which means they they present anywhere from birth up to about twenty five. Uh, I think my ADHD presented when I was like early teens. Um, but you've always got these conditions and you're always problem solving without realizing it. If I broke my leg tomorrow, that's something new to get used to. Whereas if I, with my ADHD and whatnot, I've always had it. So I've always had to overcome whatever, mm. you know, my working memory or effort yeah. or whatever. And I've just put things in place. So it's just, it's, it's that natural training from birth. Mm. Um, and it becomes instinctive to find a solution to a problem mm -hmm. rather than, than thinking about worrying about the problem. I'm trying to find the solution. That's the. Yeah. Yes. I, I can relate a lot to that. Yeah. I do not have a diagnosis of ADHD. However, I think if I went for one, I would probably get it. And I am always looking for improvement. How do I make mm -hmm. things better? How do I make the world better? What's the next thing? Some of that is because I get bored very easily and I go, oh, what's the new next shiny thing? Yeah, that I need, need the dopamine, yeah, yeah. Get some dopamine <laughs> on. Um, but so, yeah, so that, you know, it's, it's, it's a struggle then to be attentive and focus because you're constantly like, oh, and there's a, um, oh and I never thought and something else yeah. um, unless you are very passionate about this next new shiny thing and you're right let's get hyper focused on that so yeah. I can absolutely <laughs> relate to some of the things that, that you're talking about there just to, before we move on to the the final question then we'll go into Q&A because I can see loads of stuff in the chat box in um it just with everybody who's attended today is anyone already working in an industry that you would say has a high level of neurodiversity? You know how we mentioned already there, um, potentially in engineering. Pop it in the chat box. Let us know what industry you're in, because, you know, you already have potentially a large workforce of neurodiverse people. What challenges are you still facing? And, you know, how, you know, how are you managing um, and what improvements have you been able to make by having that larger neurodiverse workforce? So yeah, pop that in the chat box. Bit of a last question for you, Mark. You know, we've touched oh. on a lot there. We've touched on um, budgets. <laughs> we've touched on strategy. We've touched on um, you know how do we make sure that we are uh, thinking about the people and how do we embrace it to uh, make it neuro inclusive for um, for any potential new co um, colleagues wanting to come through the doors and come and work for us as an organization and how do we attract and retain that brilliant talent? Um, my last question really is, how would a neuro inclusion and neurodiversity audit or benchmark and activity help everybody in the room today as an initial first step? Because we always need a first step, don't we? All of this stuff sounds amazing, but sometimes it can get overwhelming. What is that first step that we could think about in terms of a neuro inclusion and neurodiversity audit? Um, in short, I was just thinking about it there. I've, 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 it's a marketing thing. I, it's, it's a SWOT exercise, isn't it? It's trying to find out where is an organization or as a team or within a policy where your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and, and, and threats are, whether that's, that's to retaining people, to including people, whatever that might be, uh, or to a, from a tribunal perspective, <laughs> where's your, uh, are you going to prevent that? Um but um, yeah, essentially, um, a neuro inclusion audit is there to find out where the hidden barriers and tripwires are, and then to move. Uh, you know, um, so what I'm looking for, eliminate them um, as, as best you can um, to make sure you're including as as many people as possible. And as I said, it might be the culture, it might be policies, it might be a procedure, it might be the way of jobs. Um, you know, set up might mean that, that you just need to swap the order around if you can or 
on a production line a little bit difficult, but in, in some some areas it, it's uh, it's not. Um, so yeah, it's trying to find out what the hidden barriers are and trip wires and, and 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 get those eliminated to make sure that people can come into work and 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 thrive and be themselves and and not have to have to worry. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it, it's I think it's an ascent. I mean. It's what I do, so I'll always promote it. But I think it's, for regardless of condition, I think everybody needs to audit for everything everywhere because at least you know, and this is the, the, the business owner's head, you want to know where your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats are. Mm -hmm. um, but an audit, um, I was doing workplace assessments and I was asked by somebody, there was three people, uh, Three people who were diagnosed and one who, who the word show, um, who were neurodiverse, uh, working in the same team. They said, oh, can you do some workplace assessments? Mm -hmm. And I thought, yes, there's some elements where you need to look at individually. But I thought, you know what? Why don't I expand this out? And a few years ago, that's what I did. So it, it's a workplace assessment, but on a wider scale without a named individual. Um, so you're not looking at a particular job. job. Well, you, you can look at a job, uh, but a, a, an individual role if you like who's worked a person you can look at a role but not a person so yeah <laughs> so when i sit this the adhd i've got three thoughts running through my head they all come into the station but don't actually stop and off it goes <laughs> uh, sometimes they merge and you might get three merge sensors but i don't know if it makes sense that's fine <laughs> but anyways, uh, please, ask me challenge me don't worry about that no <laughs> is that why you've got lists on lists on lists oh man <laughs> <laughs> That's that's really interesting, and I think you know we've got to find the starting point, don't we? And without that initial audit, we don't have any data, we don't have any insights, we don't really know where to start. But once we've done that audit, we're then able to create our strategy around the problems. So these yeah, are the yeah. problems from the audit. We now need to build our strategy out of how we actually solve these problems, how we're going to measure that it's working, and then. Ta-da! To the senior leadership team, this is how much it's going to cost us to do this and get yeah. that budget signed off. Yeah. And then also, this is the benefits that we're going to receive from it, from that kind of bottom line level as well. So, you know, I think that makes absolute clear sense to me. And, you know, let us know in the chat box if this is hitting, hitting home to you as well, you know, who's sat listening in here. We've got loads of questions in the chat box mark so i i know we said we would talk for another 45 minutes yeah. well no, sorry another 15 minutes but are you okay if we go into the chat box and start looking at some of this stuff in here because it seems really yeah yeah just as you're as you're picking out some questions yes. i'll just quickly say with, with, with reasonable adjustments um it's like playing top trumps not every adjustment is suitable in an environment for everybody and a, an adjustment for one person may affect another person. Um, I was at a focus group a year ago um, for all kinds of different disabilities and, and this guy's visually impaired. Um, and one of the things as an autistic person, and I'm hypersensitive to this, is, is, is touch, is when I walk over the raised pavement, you know, the bubbles, it really goes through me. So I'm thinking, well, I'm neurodiverse, get rid of that. It's like, oh, hang on a minute, no. <laughs> He's visually impaired, he needs help for his safety. He wins on that one on, on the game of top trumps. So mm -hmm. it's something I have to compromise and go, I'll put it with that. He's going to be okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll uh, if he's going to be safe, I'll put up with that one. That's um, really insightful. Yeah. yeah. And and it is, as I suppose, that that's a case of you know, some of these questions in here as well. Um, it's probably going to help us to think a little bit about that. You know, how do, if you have a team of highly neurodiverse people, like some of the industries yeah. that people are mentioning there already, you know, and then how do you manage everybody's um, potential need for reasonable adjustments as well, especially if they're all different? So we'll start off with some of the challenges that people are facing, Mark. And yeah. um, the first one there is how do we manage a noise, like a lot of noise in like a busy office environment? Right. Um, in an office environment, um, that's easier to manage than obviously if you're on a production line somewhere because you can't just shut the machines down. Um, but... Um, Open, uh, Microsoft did a report uh, a 
few years ago now, so about the open plan office. It's not just the noise that carries from one end to the other. There's the visual distractions, and if there's a kitchen at one end, uh, you know, how far does that coffee smell come up? I love the smell of coffee. Some people don't, but somebody's got an egg sandwich somewhere and so on, um, and the noise and clatter of that. So it's just trying to speak to the people who are neurodiverse and find out what it is that is causing them a difficulty with any noise or visual element. Because like from a noise perspective, some people it's a high pitch. And for me, it's a low rumble. High pitch noises I'm all right with. <laughs> um, and some people it's like, uh, what is it a voice? It could be with ADHD. Um, if I can properly hear somebody on a table across there, I can quickly rule it out in my head that I, they don't need me or it's got nothing to do with me. I can I can ignore that. Whereas if somebody's, you know, in a lower tone, I'm like, hang on. So I, I become then distracted and then annoyed. So it's just trying to trying to find. It, I wear over the ear headphones, um, which is noise cancelling. Um, I think what I recommend is try and find quiet places to have meetings uh, and, and break up the office into sort of zones and have a, a quiet zone, but make sure it, it's, you know, you could put some some uh, shelving up with some plants on so it's visually no longer distracting, but you need also something that's noise absorbing um, as well. So some noise absorbent um, boards or whatever as well, mm -hmm. that, that could help. Uh, and just put some some panels, just a, a panel, mm -hmm. um, panel, a couple of panels, and that uh, that could echo the noise. So you've got to be careful. It's a glass panel that's visual and glares and reflects. But yeah, um, <laughs> well, you you could potentially take us down a bit of a rabbit hole, Mark. With uh, some of these this is the thing. That you're so talking which about you're, you're pulled to yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and I think is, if there's a few people it? in there, if you've got one neurodiverse person, it's a lot easier until the next one comes along who has a different difficulty um but that first but just talk to them and find out what it is if there's mm -hmm. any if, if anything's causing the problem because some people don't have a problem with noise yeah going neurodiverse. some people do yeah um, and then it depends on the pitch and 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 if they're near a photocopier as well people walking about is the floor quite solid and people walking about does that need a thicker carpet um you know um, yeah, the, yeah, gosh, the, the, yeah, that's rabbit definitely hole. a rabbit hole you just yeah. potentially took us down there. And I suppose this is, you know, how maybe is why once we do have, um, you know, gosh, when did the open office environment, you know, happen where it was all, you know, open, open plan and how that much of much of. Um, much of an impact that might have potentially made as well. But there were a couple of things that, you know, you pointed out there is speak to the individual. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, them so, drive it. yeah. What, and then what can you change? Because a reasonable adjustment, it, it has to be meet the criteria as well for the Equality Act, doesn't it? So, yeah. um, so you've got the criteria of, is it is it actually reasonable? Is it reasonable? Can we afford to do that? So it may be like, oh, actually, you know, you could end up putting reasonable adjustments all in all day long, but that's not the case because your reasonable adjustment has to be reasonable. It has to prevent that disability from being an issue in the workplace, but also from an employer perspective as well. Um, you know, there's potential around financial. I know somebody's asked about the the funding in there, but um, mm. So, you know, asking and then what are the reasonable adjustments that could help and then considering them. We saw this a lot with mental health, reasonable adjustments at the start of, um, you know, the rise in the movement around uh, creating mentally healthy workplaces was that a lot of HR professionals would find themselves agreeing to every single reasonable adjustment and then not have a time scale either. And they, they were very solid and changed. And before you knew, they knew it, they would have teams of people with reasonable adjustments and then the the the, the team couldn't function normally. So, you know, that that criteria is also there for us to be able to say, 
well, that doesn't meet the criteria for a reasonable adjustment as well. So you don't get into that state where we exactly, need yeah. for it's... one person, we need to stop eggy sandwiches for another person. Yeah. We need, you know, so yeah, you could yeah, it's about it's, it's about compromise on, on both both sides. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. Um and and um yeah, she's just compromising on, on, on both sides and it's just trial and error. Um yeah. because yeah. You, you 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 know the first adjustment you think, okay, well, that's not working. Well, we'll we'll try something else. And and you just try it. And um there are quiet pods you can buy, and I'm 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 kind of on the fence on these because some are really good. Um, and some are so small, you feel trapped. So you've got rid of the noise, which is great, and the visual thing, but you feel trapped um, in, in some of the, the smaller ones. So pods, okay if you're neurotypical and for some neurodiverse people, but if you're going to feel cramped and trapped, it's, it's no good. You need to spread out and feel, you know, you've got the... the air around you yeah okay great so let's have a little look we've got some other uh, managing distractions you talked a lot there as well uh deb you've said something about group training session is this a, a challenge or is this um, a positive outcome do you mind just explaining a little bit more and just take yourself off mute on that one deb yeah hi yeah so for us it's it's a it's a most certainly a challenge um we the way we recruit we recruit large groups of people um and deliver classroom training for um you know up to up to 30 people at sometimes um and a lot of the training is provided by the clients themselves so we're then just delivering that that message mm -hmm. um and we don't have any kind of packs that we can provide so it it, it is literally nine or five classroom training and that, that certainly doesn't suit a lot of learning styles let alone you know neurodivergent individuals <laughs> well, what, what are yeah. you um, say with training stuff is you need plenty of breaks in there it's like the pomodoro thing isn't it and and break it up um you need lots of summaries and reminders um and when think whether you're onboarding or whether you're doing some training because somebody's been there 10 years uh, particularly if you're neurodiverse and, and for anybody really you need to do some refresher training uh, have a like refresher sessions and then a refresher of the refresher just to keep it in mind um, and think of it about uh, like revising for an exam are you exam ready or it, it, like trying to remember something if you've just heard it once you're going to forget most of it aren't you you've thrown lots of information um, and like you say, learning styles, obviously some are better practical, some like to watch a video, some like to read, some like spoke to or with. Um, but um, and then that person then needs to refresh their brain to tell the brain it's important. So this is where I'm thinking, you know, revising for an exam and then give it a week or so. You go over some bits again, the important bits, and then in a month, go over bits again. And then that stuff really, really sticks or, or give them a pack to go over stuff again like the um and, and when when put somebody's training or in a meeting or anything like this making notes and also listening to the person um is is quite difficult even for neurotypical people because you'll always miss something or, or whatever um for a lot of neurodiverse people it's very difficult particularly if you've got um, ADHD, or if you um, if you have uh, dysgraphia, for example, and, and you struggle with your writing anyway, so um, you know um, it's good to have. I think break it with activities and things like that, and and plenty of breaks, uh, and and provide the information beforehand. So, is there anything they can do before a meeting or before some training or whatever it is? What do they need to think about beforehand? What do they need to do? What's the framework? What's the expectations? Because um, when you start on a, on a training course, especially if you're in a, a new job, it's like you're beholden to the, the organisation because the organisation has the power. Uh, and it's the same with sharing information about your neurodiversity. <laughs> the, the power in that relationship is with your employer. 
So you're just going to be, right, okay, give me information, give me information. You don't want to put your hand up and, and disturb because we're people pleasers. We don't want to um, cause a fuss. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll let things wash over. So it's just about forcing those breaks and forcing different information and reminders and, and tasks. So loads of tips in there, wasn't there? You know, and things like you said, you're just neurotypical people when it comes to learning. Um, you know, so pre-learning, first of all, pre kind of loading people with information sounded mm. like a great one, Mark. Lots of breaks, giving people the opportunity to, you know, step away and um, making it more engaging with activities like you mentioned there. So when, you know, if you kind of, ooh, what's the something yeah. else or the distractions <laughs> popping up or, um, you know, having people engaged in activities sounds really good as well. Um, what what about and in and in does anyone put in the chat box if you already do this because I've noticed Viv's put about group training as well. What about an assessment for the learners beforehand to say does any does anybody have, um, you know, um, a neurodiverse um adjustment that needs to be thought about before the training as well was would that be something that you would potentially recommend it is um but um particularly ADHD and autistic people we're, we're not very good at um this is true across the board but more so with, with those conditions we're not very good at self analysis um, and we, without realising it, we underplay our conditions as well. So you need to ask us several times in several different ways. Okay. <laughs> um, which um, it's not that we're ignoring you the first time. It's just, yeah, I think I'm going to be all right. Yeah, that's okay. And then I might have thought about it. And because you've asked me again, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. mm, I might be all right. Yeah. And then the third time, it's like any marketing strategy, isn't it? You need to hit people three times and it's the third time that they'll bite. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, Repetitive messages. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Debs. I hope that was um, some helpful information for you as well, uh, Viv, as I saw that you'd asked a similar question there. So we've got, I want to just say 10 more minutes to look at some of this stuff. So let me have a little look. Um, what I will do though, if you would like, Mark, is to um, save this chat and send it to you so you have the opportunity to answer some of these questions. Um, you yeah. know, what we what we can do, we know everyone who's attended today, um, it may give you a great opportunity to follow up with everybody with some of the more detailed answers to the questions, if you like. Yeah, um, no problem. I'm happy to do brilliant. that. If you want to email us after that, that's fine. Great. So let's have a little look. What have we got? Ashley's asking about knowing how to help someone, especially in a quiet, a, in a quite restricted role. Ashley, do you want to explain a little bit more about what a restricted role looks like? Yeah, so for us, we have a number of different um, sort of types of people we employ. So we have a factory, we have a warehouse, we have a studio, we have an office environment, and then we have retail stores. Um, so what we find, and we try to do the best we can with like sort of loop, Ear, ear plugs and um, trying to reduce the noise in retail stores but obviously for retail it's customer for customer facing and um, so we can't reduce the that all of the time but we can rotate it and make sure people can go into the stock room or, or they can do things like that noise in the factory and in the warehouse is a bit more difficult to control because it's the machines and things like that so um I suppose it's if you've got a restricted role how how to know but I think you've kind of answered it a little bit earlier and on asking them specifically what would help them and at, you know if you if you meet one person with ADHD you've met one person with ADHD so <laughs> it's not a one it's not a one size fits all um I'm not sure if that made any sense or not but <laughs> I no, think no, you get the gist sense, perfect sense. I've, I've, I've got um the cogs that are turning um <laughs> it, it, it comes back down to we're not talking about reasonable adjustments compromise um if you are really really going to struggle and be anxious in a customer facing environment I would argue, don't even apply for that role. <laughs> Go for something else, or say, "Look, uh, I really want to work for you, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, be honest from the outset, and then see if there's any compromise there." But, um, you know, or don't try and work on a, you know, heavy production uh, production line when you you need something a bit slower paced. Uh, whereas having ADHD, I would love that production line because it's fast paced. It's I don't know what's coming next. 
obviously, well, I hope I do. The production lengths, everything's the same. But yeah, um, in that regard, you know, uh, which is why I used to live working in call centers. You didn't know what the call was. Um, so yeah, there's there's compromise on on, on both sides, but the, the person with the condition has to be realistic. Um, whilst yes, there's the Equality Act, and and, and organisations have to make adjustments. The person with the condition, it has to be realistic. Um, at the end of the day, you, you, you know, you, you can't just shut a production down line for somebody who who's sensitive to noise. You know, <laughs> just because they want to work on a Friday afternoon and that's when it's busiest. You know, um. So yeah, the, the, there's there's compromise on both 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 sides, um, and as long as there's compromise possible, then yeah, um, that's helpful. Thank you, Mark. All right. Thanks. You know Thanks, Ashley. There are so many questions in here. Like, yeah. This is amazing. I just want to break up some of the questions, though, just to share some really great things that companies are doing. Um, somebody's popped in the chat box there that they have actually recruited somebody in an HR role to specialise in this, which is absolutely amazing level of commitment and investment from that organisation. So definitely wanted to share that one. Anna's asking, where does this 5,000 a year come from? Is it the access to work scheme, Mark? Sorry, the, the 5,000 a year? Yes, you said with regards to 5,000. Oh, so you said that there was funding available to pay for reasonable adjustments. Oh, yeah, 65,000. Sorry, yeah. 65,000. Yeah, okay. 65,000. Yeah. Is so it that's access to work? That's another report I've read and forgotten about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got a research folder, to... loads of reports in. I look, I look. I look <laughs> it up. But um, the um, yeah, that that's on the Access to Works website. The sixty five, uh, six five, sixty five thousand pounds a year, um, to pay for all kinds of different things. Um, and as far as I understand, they will pay for um, you know, adjustments. It's it, it's the individual that has to apply. Uh, and the the organisation pays for, um, you know, I think they do pay for uh, if they need some building work doing uh, up to a point, uh, in some circumstances, um, or some transport or whatever it is, um, and then you just claim that back through, um, the access as to I don't know, access to work, <laughs> um. Brilliant. So the access to work stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, then this question is from Leona. How do you manage your own self-esteem and self-belief knowing that you are not neurodiverse? This is this question is really getting to the individuals now. That's, you know, that's the really the, nitty gritty, isn't it? This is the experience <laughs> stuff coming in here. Um I'll be honest, I, I don't know. Um with um, having autism and and also ADHD, I've got this this the it's like the civil war of of chaos and organisation. Um, and when I want to be organised, it's chaos. And when I want to be chaos, it's organised. Um, but it, it it's I I I just don't think about it. I, I I've stopped fighting with my own brain. I'll be honest. I just accept this is me. I mean, yeah, I, I talk about it for a living, so it, it helps. Uh, a lot of people are very private and quiet, and, and it's about a lot of people I've worked with to help. Um, but and they don't like shouting about it, whereas I, I'll shout about it. But um, I think, yeah, I've just stopped fighting with my own brain. Um, like one of the things with the ADHD model is um, effort, uh, and it used to get me, it used to get me down and bother me. Um, the uh, you know, it, it used to. I want to start something. I can see the lever to start it, and I want to. I want to pull that lever to start, but it ain't getting pulled. So I'm gonna have to go do something else, not do something, whatever it is, and it. Eventually, I get round to it, and it used to get me down that I wouldn't start. I felt lazy, and then when I found out. Um, more about ADHD and and I got my diagnosis and it's like, ah that's what it is yeah I got this operating manual essentially for me head because as humans we don't come with an operating manual and I think knowledge knowing who I am has helped it, it it's cleared a lot of fog 
like I used to get annoyed that I couldn't on a blank piece of paper I couldn't write things down. I've got my thoughts up here. I know what I want to say. I'm intelligent, um, but why couldn't I get them down? And I felt thick and stupid. And it's like, ah, right, that's part of ADHD. Fair enough. Uh, same thing with dyslexia as well, actually. Um, that's one of the crossovers. There's a few. Um, so, yeah, knowing how your condition presents in you is a massive help. And just not stop fighting with your own brain. And you just, just be open and honest to yourself and say, look, don't try and get something done. If it's going to, if your deadline's four weeks away, uh, there's no point in me starting it now. Yeah. One of the best talks, I, sorry, I'm off on a tangent. Uh, one of the best talks I did um, was a few years ago now when I've been doing this a year or two. I was coaching somebody, so I'd already started working with a company and they'd asked me to do a, a talk on ADHD. And I thought, right, I've, I'd only been doing it a year or two, but I, I needed to tweak it and make sure it was was right. Four weeks before the day, got my index cards out. Nope, nothing. Couldn't change it. A couple of weeks later, nope, nothing. I was on the train on the way down, index card and sharpies. Nope, nothing. I was sat in Costa at Gatwick Airport an hour before the session. And I was, yep, it was the best talk I've ever written. <laughs> or they said, well, they, they one of the best talk they heard. <laughs> I don't know if it was polite or it was genuine, but I think it was one of the best talks I've ever, I've ever done. Because uh, it was last minute and it was how my brain works. So in short, after a really long ADHD speech, um, knowing who you are, I think, uh, and stop fighting with your own brain. Yeah, yeah. And that's that, that's that self-acceptance, isn't it? That yeah. is being able to just be authentically who you are. Um, however, that could be pretty scary for people as well because we can, you know, be comfortable in that, but there's always that fear that if we share that, and we take the mask off, you know, what are people going to think about us and are people going to stigmatise or discriminate or think differently about us um, as well? So, you know, right at the start of the session, you know, you talk, we talked about um, the how neurodiverse people are often one of the, the lowest to be employed, yet have some of the highest IQs and um, can do wonders for workplaces. So there's that. You know, we've got to close that gap, haven't we? And yep, stop judging people and stereotyping people because of a, something that they've got no control over in, inside of them. This, I think we could talk forever on this. And there's so many questions in the chat, Mark, but we are coming up to four minutes now to the end of the session. Um, so we're going to really wrap up. So in 60 seconds, Mark, I'm going to put you, I'm going to cre recreate that Gatwick session. <laughs> 60 seconds. <laughs> Would you like to summarise what we've talked about today? Um, right, yeah. Um, as you just touched on there, the, the employment rate disparity is absolutely shocking for neurodiverse people. Um, but I, I, I don't think it comes from a bad place in a lot of cases. Uh, when I was doing the recruitment agency, somebody said to me, um, I don't want to make their condition worse. I'm like, well, you can't. <laughs> you know, you can make it better by giving somebody a purpose. Um, and bit, neurodiverse people in the workplace add so much value, add so much value. Um, and it, it's it's very easy for HR to start. You've got lots of levers. Just make a start. Uh, just make a start. You don't know which, but you know, the check or chest piece to start, but just move one. And and the game will start. Um, if I can call it a game, <laughs> um, and and send a questionnaire out to all your your, your colleagues to find out. Um, because some people don't, you know, very private. Um, but um, to find out if they have such a condition and are they being supported enough? Do they need more support? Um, and and so on. Um, and look at the resources I've got. Uh, on my website. Um, there's there's the workplace. Uh, well, I call it an estates guide, but it, it's for you know, um, talks about all kinds of different things, um, about changing a workplace for for um, being more inclusive, um, yeah. So, um, I know we talk about noise and neurodiversity, but make sure there's an employee network, um, to make lots of noise <laughs> to talk to senior leadership and say, right, what is it that's in the way 
between senior leadership, giving a budget, and people who are neurodiverse, um, you know, being able to be authentic and, and rise the ranks and so on. What's in the way? And then start chipping away at that. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. 